It's not what you know, but who you know. The world was ending. Best I figured, I had a day or two until the big one. Most people, given the ultimatum that everything they knew was about to end, were reacting as you would expect. The cars full of frantic refugees on the highway a few miles away produced a constant drone occasionally interspersed with the thin, high wail of an emergency vehicle siren or the loud crack of gunfire. Hopeless I knew, but at least it gave everybody something to focus on besides the world crumbling around them. I wasn't out there with them, desperate to go somewhere, anywhere, to get away from the hell that surrounded them. I had been living with my own personal hell for six years now, and I knew that running was pointless. Instead of their pathetic panic, I was doing something truly important, mowing my yard. It was a nice yard, big with plenty of green grass and with a dozen trees scattered here and there. Abby would have loved it. Visiting my grandparents on Great Grandpa's farm was the highlight of her summers all those years ago. I pushed that thought away and focused back on my work. Ever since the accident, yard work had been a refuge. Losing my wife soon after my daughter left a hole of sorrow and depression that was much easier to tune out when all you could hear was the whir of mower blades. As the past week's shocking revelations delved further into chaos and despair, and as people started dying by the billions, here I was in my yard, on my garden tractor going back and forth, up and down, persistently avoiding my thoughts and ignoring the world around me. Occasionally I would glance up at the sky, instinctively trying to tell the time or check the weather. It was about as useless of an exercise as mowing your yard for the end of the world. Clouds that had once stuck close to the horizon in the direction of the city had transformed over the last week into a pervasive haze of dust, which had an almost eerie effect on the bits of sunlight that filtered through, rendering objects flat and without shadows. As I finished up another row, the ground shook with a low rumble. It had been doing that for a while now, but I wasn't too concerned. What was the point of worrying? I turned to head back up the yard and stopped for a moment beside the house. I had lived alone on this small acreage a short dozen miles west of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, for over six years now. The acreage, my retreat and refuge, had been my grandparents' home for decades. When they had passed, it was left to my father, who had rented it out to various tenants over the following few years, until, all too soon, he also passes. After inheriting it upon his death, I left the property empty and ignored for over a year. I had no intention of living out there among all the happy family memories when my wife and I had no happiness left. She seemed to agree, not with the not living out there part, but simply with the not living at all. Losing my daughter and losing my wife left me with nothing. I had sold our home in the city, quit my daily job as a designer, cashed out our investments and savings, and fled in pain and sorrow to this acreage, my last retreat. Now I was just another tired, middle-aged loner with a tragic past and no future, just living day to day. I had finished cutting the grass on the back half of the acreage and had moved onto the front portion when I noticed a cloud of dust moving towards the property. Barely slowing enough to make the turn, my neighbor's white sprinter van skidded into his driveway and raced up into the garage, just barely missing the still opening overhead door with the van's tall roof. Had it been anybody else, I would have been surprised at their reckless driving. But honestly, this was nothing new for Pickett. I had seen too many strange things living next to that guy. I was surprised to see him at all. He had left in a rush a few weeks ago, and I wasn't expecting to see him again before the end, which the news was estimating would come sometime tonight or maybe tomorrow. I returned to my task, hoping to finish well before dark, so I could enjoy the final evening on my porch with my only remaining companion, a bucket of iced beers. I never got to see the sunset that evening or cantor. Through the cloudy reddish haze, but I finished my yard work about that time it would have been setting. I had just parked the riding mower in my garage when suddenly there was another tremor, this one fairly strong. I held onto the door frame as the ground swayed and a few moments later, a shockwave hit. Woomph! I found myself on the ground dazed. I had been knocked back into the garage and showered with shattered glass from the side windows and the overhead lights. Luckily, the windows had been a tempered safety glass and the debris was not sharp shards, just gravelly, annoying bits. I got up, brushing the glass off and out of my shirt, when the power went out, causing what lights remained to go dark. For a moment, I debated heading to the basement to duck and cover before I remembered that it was pointless and that I did not really care. 
I grabbed the cordless flashlight from my workbench and went into the house. The tremors continued occasionally, though not as bad as before. In the house, there was broken glass everywhere, and only the heavy furniture remained anywhere close to where it had originally been sitting. Cautiously stepping over broken window glass and ignoring the picture frames now scattered on the floor, I made my way to the kitchen where I grabbed a bucket of ice and the six pack of bottled pilsners from the fridge. As one last fuck you to the universe, I left the door open on the refrigerator and freezer. The power was out anyway, and I wasn't going to be around to care about the spoiling food soon. Wary of more tremors, I carefully made my way to the porch. As little as there was left in the world, breaking a bottle of beer that I had prudently hoarded through the looting and chaos these last weeks would have been the final straw. Christ, I murmured, surveying the debris and branches now strewn over my freshly mowed yard. My porch was also a mess, and I had to retrieve the cushions from my favorite chair from the nearby bushes. But once those lost items were restored, I sat and popped open the first of the cold brews. I allowed myself to think back to how this week was supposed to go, had things been happier. Abby would be turning 18, there would probably have been some kind of party, and maybe even a fancy new car with one of those obnoxious ribbons from the commercials parked in the driveway. We would be celebrating her going off to college in a few months. Mary and I would have been celebrating our 25th year of marriage. She had always wanted to travel the country, and with our kid out of the house, we finally could have. Hoisting the beer, I gave a toast to Abby and Mary. I miss you both so much, but for the first time, I am glad you are gone and not here with me to face what's to come tonight. I paused before continuing. I guess I'll be seeing you soon. I wish things could have been different. I wanted to say more, but the words just wouldn't come. Abby had only been 10 when that drunk idiot had blown through that stop sign. My wife and our marriage had never recovered from the grief. I don't know if the relationship would have lasted even if she hadn't found the bottom of a bottle of pills. As the words stopped and the tears began to flow, I silently finished my beer and stared out at the darkening horizon. It was full twilight and the red skies continued even into the looming darkness, but now were more intense towards the city. The fires must be spreading. A steady breeze was blowing towards the north, back to where the shockwave had originated. I was into my second beer when in the gloom I noticed Pickett standing near the fence line between our properties. He had his hand up, signaling me to come towards him. What does he want? I muttered. I could not imagine him wanting to spend this last night with me anymore, then I would want to spend it with him. I debated whether to ignore him and continue my solo vigil or to go see what he wanted. Finally, curiosity and responsibility won out and I got up and headed over to the fence. As I approached, I noticed he was wearing stranger clothing than normal. It was like a pair of coveralls or a one-piece uniform like a mechanic would wear, which was odd because Pickett was the last thing from being handy. He even hired out his yard work, for Christ's sake. Adding to his unusual attire, the suit was made of a strange, silvery material and was covered with fittings and connections that reminded me of something out of a sci-fi story. John, he said, you are still here. Good. Where the hell else would I be, Pickett? I replied. I did not know how you would handle the current events. I had hoped you would remain rather than attempt to flee the coming destruction and chaos. Not much point in that, Pickett. From what I have heard, there is no point or safe place to flee to, and I am too old and out of shape to fight the panicked hordes for scraps, or to go find some hole in the ground to hide out and probably be buried alive in. My comment brought a decidedly shocked expression to Pickett's normally unreadable face. That is remarkably close to what I offer, John. Well, not the fighting hordes part. If you want to live to see another day, then come to my dwelling and descend into the sublevel basement. There, I will leave you a chance for your survival. What the hell, I thought. What, do you have a bunker of some sort down there? Wondering if he was a prepper. It would certainly help explain some of his odd behavior, if not his strange clothing. I do not have time to explain as I will be leaving shortly, and there is much to do. After I leave, go to my dwelling, as I have instructed, and you may survive. Now I was even more confused. He was leaving but wanted me to go to his basement or something. What the hell, Pickett? You are not making any sense. Why would I want to go die in your basement? I have my own if I want to hide out. Where are you running off to tonight anyway? John, there is no time to explain. 
My pods still must be prepped, and I must leave. You have helped me over the past few years many times, and you have kept to yourself and not betrayed my activities to others of your kind. For this, I offer you a chance for survival. I just stood there staring, trying to digest what I had just heard. My pod, others of your kind. What the hell? Pick it, thanks but no thanks. I turned to leave. I did not have time for his craziness. John, wait, I paused, that's a... John, you have little more than an hour before the spreading flame fronts reach this place and consume you. Please heed my request and take refuge in my sublevel. I resumed the walk back to my house and porch, staggering as another tremor shook the ground. John, he yelled, Abby would not have wanted you to give up, just as she would not have wanted you to retreat from the living as you have in recent years. I stopped and spun around. Just how the fuck do you know about Abby and what she would think? I yelled back. I know all about you, John. If you change your mind, heed my instructions. You have less than an hour. At that, he turned and ran into his house. I stood there watching him go, my heart thumping and temples throbbing. After I got control of myself, I turned to return to my porch. It was dark enough that I needed the flashlight to avoid the branches and debris in the yard. Now the sky to the north had a red glow to match the one coming from the city and its fires to the east. I also noticed a few new fires off in the distance, some towards the highway and some towards a few of the nearby farms and small towns. The distant highway must be one big mass of people fleeing the city. What a sad, sad, hopeless mess. Back on the porch and with a fresh beer, I thought of Pickett and his offer. What a strange bird Pickett was. I remembered the first time I met him back almost six years, around a month after I had moved in. He was standing by his large white van in his driveway looking at the left rear tire. I was mowing, of course, and after considering ignoring him, I stopped by the fence and shut off the rider. Ahoy, neighbor. Tire problems? He turned to me and replied, John! Good! I was unable to reach my garage before progress was halted. If I obtain replacement parts, would you be willing to install them on this vehicle? I will provide payment. Uh, how the fuck did he know my name and buy replacement parts? Did he mean a new tire? I guess. When will you have a new tire? I yelled back. Instead of answering, he walked around to the other side of the van, got out his cell phone and took a picture of the opposite rear tire. Maybe he's taking a video. I wondered as the process took at least 10 seconds. He then came back around the van and started towards the fence where I was waiting. As he approached, I got my first good look at him. My first impression of him was that he was different. Probably 20 years younger than me, maybe in his early 30s. Taller than me by a few inches, probably around six foot two or even six foot three. Skinny with bones showing, especially around his face, the opposite of my pudgy and out of shape overweight frame. He was completely bald where I was just balding. His expression was strange as if he weren't sure what emotion he was supposed to be feeling at any given time. No matter the weather, he was always wearing a big bulky pair of sunglasses. They reminded me of those smart glasses I saw in the news years ago, the high-tech ones with a built-in computer and camera or whatnot that everyone had been excited about. I could not see his eyes through the lenses, but by the way he turned his head, I knew he was taking in everything around him as he approached. Arriving at the fence, he said, I shall return in two hours with the required parts. He then turned and left without another word. I just watched as he entered his garage and shut the overhead door behind him. Wow, that is one strange guy. I muttered and drove my riding mower over to my garage to get my car jack and tire changing tools. I attached my small yard trailer to the mower, loaded the jack, tire iron, and a towel to kneel on, and headed down the driveway and over to the neighbors. As I parked next to his van, I noticed that not only was the tire shredded, but the rim was worn down and ruined also. It looked like the hub and brakes were okay though, which meant that he had probably only driven a few miles on the flat before reaching his home. Shaking my head, I got out the jack, cracked the wheel nuts loose with the wrench, and proceeded to raise the rear corner of the van. I then fully removed the nuts and kicked the tire loose from the hub. It was stubborn, but finally broke loose. I looked at the house and seeing no sign of the strange guy, unhooked my trailer, leaving it and my tools and headed back home to finish my mowing. 
Almost exactly two hours after he entered the house, his garage door opened and he came walking out, rolling a new tire and rim towards the van. If he had left the house, I certainly hadn't seen it. Did he have a spare in his garage the entire time? What the hell? Why did it take him two hours to retrieve it? I rode my mower back over to the parked van where he was now standing. He pointed at the new rim and tire and asked, John, will this be satisfactory? Looks good, I replied while maneuvering the tire onto the hub's protruding studs. I quickly spun on the lug nuts and wrenched them snug. After lowering the jack a bit to let the wheel grab the ground, I finished fully tightening the nuts. I reattached my trailer to my rider, loaded the jack, wrenches, and towel, and then did one last check overall, including checking the pressure. It was as I was pocketing my tire gauge that I noticed what was bugging me. The new tire and rim were not new. In fact, the dirt, scuffs, and wear on the tire were similar to what was on the other tires. What was really strange, though, was the raised letters on the new tire were printed backward. Even the fine printing was backwards. I glanced at my neighbor about to say something when I noticed he had a funny, apprehensive look on his face. I decided to mind my own business and keep my mouth shut. I did notice one peculiar scratch on the rim and on impulse, went around to the van's other rear tire to inspect that tire. I called out, just checking the tire pressure on this one to make sure they match. He just watched me. When I bent down to the other rim, I noticed the same peculiar scratch on this rim as on the other side, just mirrored. Weird. I checked that pressure. All good here, and returned to the neighbor. Will 10 units of currency be sufficient? He asked. Puzzled, but at this point beyond trying to ask questions, I just nodded. He handed over a stack of bills, and when I went to stuff them in my pocket, I noticed that they were brand new $100 bills. Whoa there, neighbor. This is way too much money, I stammered. It is what we agreed upon, correct? 10 units, he replied with a puzzled expression. I misunderstood, I replied, and handed him the money back. He was confused and looked troubled. I am unsure of how to proceed. How should I rectify this dilemma? He asked. I was expecting ten bucks, not a thousand, I replied. Do you have any smaller bills? No, other than gold. This is all I have. Gold? What the hell? I wondered what I would do with ten dollars worth of gold. That would be like a tiny speck, right? I'd lose it, most likely. Well, let's just call it a favor then. You'll owe me a favor in the future, I replied. This seemed to trouble him even more, and he looked like he did not want to leave it at that. Before this continued longer, I said, Look, it's no big deal. I have to get back to my chores. I'll see you around in, I guess, and proceeded to get on my rider and leave. Thank you, John, he said as he watched me drive away. That reminded me. He knew my name somehow, but I did not know his. I quickly stopped and turned back to him. By the way, it was nice meeting you. You seem to know my name. Can I have yours? He thought for a bit and then replied, You can refer to me as Pickett. Okay? Stranger and stranger. See you around, Pickett, I replied and drove home. Back in the here and now, I noticed the wind was blowing stronger and the trees were beginning to whip, shedding leaves and branches. It smelled of smoke. The corner of the porch I sat on was half sheltered from the brunt of the wind, but it was still strong enough to cause the empty beer bottles to roll around on the porch floor. The few curtains remaining inside the house were blowing out the broken windows and waving like pale flags in the darkness. The scene was surreal, lit only by the glow of my one emergency nightlight in the living room hallway. I heard a sharp crack come from Pickett's acreage and turned in time to see the debris raining down from what had once been the roof of his barn. Shingles and boards were still fluttering to the ground when I saw a small cylindrical object, about twice the size of a water heater and lit by blue flames, rise through the hole in the roof. The object cleared the roof and leaned over towards the southwest before shooting off faster than a blink of the eye. Boom! came the report, and I felt another small shockwave. I grabbed the beer bucket before it could tip and cursed in shock. What the fuck? Well, now I knew what Pickett meant by pod. Pickett's barn now had a flickering rosy glow in the window openings, and I could tell that something was burning inside. For a moment, I contemplated calling the fire department or running over to see if I could use a hose to extinguish the fire before ruefully remembering that that would be pointless. I decided to just sit and enjoy the view. Pickett's pod had been a rocket or missile or something, 
Was he a government agent or mad scientist? Or was he maybe a billionaire in hiding who had dreams of a personal space force as was becoming popular these days? As weird as he was, maybe he was an alien? The moment I thought that I remembered more of his past strangeness and figured that alien was probably closer to the truth than any other possibility. Wow, what a bombshell to learn on the last day ever. I sat thinking more about Pickett. He was always coming and going in that big white sprinter van of his. He would pull into his garage, shut the door, and not be seen for days or weeks until suddenly his overhead door would open and his van would leave. Days or weeks would pass before he returned home. The rare times I remembered seeing him or speaking with him were each as strange as the first. I recalled another time a few years ago when a strong thunderstorm had blown through the area. The next morning, as I was out cleaning up my yard, I noticed that one of Pickett's trees had fallen and a limb had broken one of his windows. Pickett was standing by the fallen tree and was cutting the branches apart with a chainsaw of some sort. He had the limb removed from the window opening and the bulk of the tree reduced to shorter logs. Something about this bothered me until I realized that I did not remember hearing the typical loud chainsaw noises all morning. Curious, I walked over to the fence line to get a closer look, but he had already gone inside. I surveyed the scene for a bit and figured he would need to replace the window and hire someone to remove the wood and debris. As I turned to return to my own chores, I heard him call out, John, may I have a moment of your time? We met at the fence line and he asked, John, the recent weather has damaged my dwelling. Would you assist in making repairs? I would pay you. What do you need help with Pickett? I'm pretty handy, but replacing a window might be more than I'd be willing to do. I do not require the window to be replaced, just its opening and filled. Would you be willing to obtain a parcel of manufactured laminated cellulose, affix it to the opening and cover it with pigment? He asked, WTF? I had to think about that for a moment. Manufactured laminated cellulose. Did he mean plywood? Pigment? Paint? Strange. Um, yeah, I could drive to town and buy a sheet of plywood and a quart of paint and cover the window opening for you, I guess. He nodded. Good, Will. Five units of dollar one hundred currency be sufficient for you to obtain the materials and perform the labor required. Five units again. What the fuck? Sure. I'll head to town around noon to get the materials, and I should be back in time to finish the work before dark. He handed me the money, again five crisp new dollar, 100 bills, turned and walked back towards his house. For the next hour, I did my own cleanup while watching Pickett remove his own logs and debris. What was strange was that he would grab a log and drag it into his garage, close the door, and then five minutes later, the door would open and out he would come to repeat the process. What was he doing with the logs? There was no smoke or chimney, so he did not have a stove burning the logs. And besides, the logs were green anyway. Maybe he was stacking them in the back of the garage or something. Strange? Near noon, I headed to town in my pickup truck. At the big orange box, I purchased a sheet of three quarters, thick, good quality exterior plywood, and a quart of tan paint, which I thought would match Pickett's house color nicely. I also purchased a tube of sealant, and enough hardware to attach the plywood. The materials ate most of dollar two hundred, and with the change I treated myself to lunch at the good old greasy arches. They do make a good, consistent tasting. Burger though, which never fails to fill the hole. Back at the homestead, I backed my truck up to my garage and loaded my stepladder, saw horses, cordless tools, and a few other items I would need for the repair. I drove over to Pickett's and backed up to the side of his house with the damaged window. I noticed that his yard was now free of logs, branches, and debris. No picket, though. I unloaded my tools in the sheet of plywood, set up my ladder, and climbed up to the window to measure the opening. Pickett must have removed all the broken glass and the bulk of the window frame. He'd also installed some sort of clear membrane on the inside of the opening to protect the contents of his house. It looked and felt like plastic film, but it was stronger and very tight when I poked it with my finger. Strange. It was fairly clear, and I could see a bit inside his house. The room must have been a smaller bedroom. It was empty, but I could see through the doorway into the room behind. In that room, there were dozens of flat-screen TVs or computer monitors of some sort, and on each I could see newscasts, financial shows, or 
other broadcasts scrolling information of all types. I did not see Pickett anywhere, but there were shadows moving on the far wall, so he must have been in there somewhere doing something. I noticed that a few of the screens were showing images of his yard, my house, and even me looking into his window. Feeling embarrassed, I got back to work and took my measurements. I climbed down, cut the plywood, installed and sealed it, and finished up with the paint. All this happening with no sign of picket, no checking on my work, no nothing. Strange. I loaded my tools and headed home, and as was typical, did not see picket again for weeks. I was interrupted from my historical musings by the headlights and sounds of a car speeding down the front road. As it neared my driveway, it slammed its brakes and slid to a stop. A window must have been open for I could hear someone screaming and a small child crying. I sat on the porch in the darkness and watched it wondering what it would do, hoping it would just drive on. As it continued to just sit there, I wondered if I should go to the doorway where just inside my loaded shotgun stood. I had been ignoring the shotgun pretty much all day, though it was never far from my mind. It was my last plan for tonight. Not yet, but soon. I wondered if I should I get it now in case I needed to defend myself. With a sad smile, I just shook my head and realized what would be the point. If they came up my lane, I could just grab the gun and slip off around the corner of the house into the cornfield behind my yard where I would be almost impossible to find in the darkness. There, later but soon, the middle of the cornfield would be as good a place as any. But that escape plan would go unneeded as the car slowly resumed driving and was soon over the hill and gone. I was both relieved and saddened. The yard was now silent again. Silent if you discount the distant sirens, rumbles, booms, and the increasing wind. And I opened a third beer. Pickett being an alien returned to my thoughts. I almost wanted to find someone to tell the exciting news to, but laughed at the thought. Why would I start spreading gossip now, especially when no one would believe me? Or if they did, do anything about it anyway? I remembered many times over the past six years, people asking me about Pickett and what it was like to live by such a strange man. Sometimes it was brought up during my Saturday morning breakfast outings, where once a week I would treat myself to a trip to a nearby small town cafe for a hearty breakfast and coffee. Though I kept mostly to myself, if you go to the same place long enough, the regulars will start to chat with you. One morning, one of the regulars, Colby was his name I remembered, asked me about Pickett. I told him I did not have much to do with the man, but Colby persisted with the chatter and comments. He was the local garbage man and was telling the group that a few years back he had stopped by Pickett's to inquire about doing his weekly garbage pickup. Pickett had apparently replied, I do not need garbage services as I do not generate garbage. That got a chuckle from the group and made me realize that in all the time I had been Pickett's neighbor, I had never seen anything arrive, accumulate, or leave other than Pickett in his white sprint on her van. Strange. Maybe in the time left to me, I should sneak over to Pickett's and snoop around just to see if the man, or alien, had a pile of garbage hidden somewhere on his property. I was chuckling over that thought when suddenly, wham, the largest tremor yet hit. Down I went as the front of the porch collapsed and the deck dropped a few feet to the ground. I was dumped out of my chair and tumbled face first down the porch and into the bushes out front. WTF. I had no idea where my beer ended up. I rolled over groaning and lay there nauseous as the ground continued to shake and heave, wondering if the house would be coming down on top of me next. There was a crash from next door as the now fully engulfed burning roof of Pickett's barn collapsed and shot flames out the windows, adding even more dramatic lighting to the already apocalyptic scene. My flashlight had slid to the ground near me, so I grabbed it when the tremors died down enough for me to attempt to stand. Christ, I muttered as I stood there looking at my house. Aside from the collapsed porch and broken windows, the back portion where my bedroom lay was leaning and swaying, and I thought I smelled gas. I decided to risk the slope broken porch and potential gas leak one last time and quickly made it up and into the open doorway to search for my shotgun. It had fallen to the side, so I quickly bent to retrieve it and scrambled back off the shaky porch and out into the yard well away from the house. There I stood surveying the carnage while I caught my breath. It was getting pretty nasty as far as the wind, noise, and continual rumbling and shaking. From this new vantage, I could see that the red glow to the north was now much brighter than it had been and spread all the way to the horizon towards the east and west. 
The flames must be getting closer, I suspected. There were even flashes of light off in the distance in the red glow, which could have been explosions or lightning. I suspected that this was the coming front that Pickett had mentioned. For a moment, I contemplated death by burning in hellfire, or death by eating a load of buckshot. Neither sounded very appealing when I thought about it, but at least the buckshot would be instant. Would I have the courage to face the buckshot, though? I looked down at the gun and knew it had to be soon. Now? Once again, I opened the gun's action to verify the shell was there. Closing the action again, I hesitated, looking around unsure. Should I go back inside my house to end it, or do it here in the yard? Turning, I saw Pickett's barn was fully engulfed in flames now, and I noticed the wind was blowing the flame and smoke away from both my yard and his house. As I stared at his house, I remembered his last offer and plea to me. If you want to live, did I? Do I really think there could be a future after this night? Not a chance. Would my daughter have wanted me to even try? I imagined if she were here with me, I'd be fighting till the end to keep her safe. What the hell? At least I can go take a look at Pickett's garbage pile, I muttered. Worst case was that I would eat the buckshot load over at his place instead of mine. I quickly headed towards the fence, set down the gun and flashlight on the ground, and lumbered over the top fence rail. I shook my head, chuckling at my safe gun handling, and wondered if it would be ironic to accidentally shoot myself while crossing a fence, minutes before blowing my head off anyway. I retrieved both the gun and flashlight and headed for Pickett's front door.